Right, so uh, we can start the second part of the afternoon, which will be giving, starting with uh, Janab Aydin. Uh, I'd like to thank him very much for being with us. We've uh, known each other a long time here in Rome. Janab is a um, degree in uh, political science and sociology at the Boazija University in Istanbul. He studied Catholic uh, theology and Church's dialogue here at the Gregorian University. And he studied ecclesiastical and constitutional law at the UMSA, sociology of religions at the Angelicum. He's uh, lecturer at the master's degree in cultural religious mediation established in the philosophy department of the Pontifical Salesian University and he also teaches at the summer school uh, UCA University of Cambridge and he's cooperated with the Jacques Maritain International Institute and he's a member of the um, board of the Religion for Peace. Um, he cooperates with various institutions, confraternity of the minor friars in Istanbul, um, dialogue platform in Brussels, and uh, FID in Frankfurt. He has a uh, is um, a holder of a emeritus scholarship at the Pontifical Council for Di Interreligious Dialogue, and he uh, carries that research in uh, religious and political dialogue in Europe and the Mediterranean. He's also uh, creator and um, of a radio uh, program which is called the Steps of Dialogue, which uh, is broadcast on On the Move Radio. So thank you, Jenna, um, for being with us. And I'll give the floor to speak uh, Joseph in the Quran through the eyes of Philo of Alexander. Thank you. Massimo for this introduction. And uh, I'd very much like to thank uh, Professor Scarabin, who uh, provided a great help. It's very uh, useful to hear a real expert in uh, the field, which has really um, opened, made my task much easier. Because as you'll have heard, I'm not an Islamologist and I'm not a direct scholar of the Quran, but here with you I'll be sharing a vision to understand better how we can uh, approach the uh, Joseph of the Quran, starting from um, Philo's method, going back to his uh, age, trying to understand what he wanted to do by um, speaking of um, Joseph to an audience which is different from his own. So he tried to describe a figure of um, the Hebrew biblical tradition to a Greek or Roman public. So um, an effort to establish a dialogue. So what uh, Philos um, handed down to us is um, considerable uh, heritage to approach into cultural dialogue, and I don't want to um, as uh, Rav Levy was saying a few years ago, if I understand, if I remember, in the conclusions, this research on Philo also has the goal of uh, building a bridge between intellectual research and the social uh, responsibilities we have. So I'm trying to provide my contribution from uh, this point of view, basing myself on intercultural and interreligious dialogue. Now here we have a PowerPoint, uh, which I will be following uh, mostly. First of all, we've already heard this um, part, which I'll cover very briefly. Those who are listening at the, mo at the moment um, probably understand uh, the Joseph of the Bible better. We've uh, heard 
The uh, previous speaker gave us a very deep insight, but uh, let's say something from my point of view. Uh, Joseph, we find him in chapter 12 of the Quran. It's a very interesting chapter in the Quran because it's a real story which uh, begins and ends. In other uh, stories in the Quran, uh, if we speak of other interesting uh, figures, uh, Isa or Maria, so Jesus Christ, Mary, they appear in certain uh, verses in the Quran and then uh, another uh, figure comes in, so it's hard to follow their story. Whereas this um, chapter is a true story with a beginning and an end. And, uh, According to Islamic faith, too, uh, God leaves to Muhammad uh, an uh, interpretation. That is what the Quran says. Tawil, Tawil is an important concept. It's not only used uh, for interpreting dreams, but also to interpret uh, events. Also, in the case of Yusuf. Because you'll see in this chapter, we don't only speak of Yusuf as someone who interprets dreams um, and sees things that others can't see, but also uh, some objective events too. And this is linked to his ability, though his vocation to be political as uh, Philo. Um, says when he wanted to explain this figure to the Greco-Roman public. The Tawil is important and it's also key to um, read what we're going to discuss this afternoon because it's a term used uh, to refer to how Quranic verses are explained. There's another uh, chapter in the Quran, Oliwel, uh, famous verse, seventh verse, which uh, speaks of uh, two types of verse, the clearer ones, the ones which are more evident, and the kamute shabi, the ones which are allegorical. So here it is important because uh, all the Quranic verses can be considered as belonging to one of these categories. And here, speaking of uh, Joseph, Yusuf, it's uh, useful to understand how we can uh, interpret these uh, Quranic verses, uh, which is something which is inherent in the Quran as a key to its reading, to provide uh, historical context. Um, I'll use the term zitz im leben. There are many uh, interpretations, but just to understand what we're talking about, we're talking about um, Nekani verses, a revealed chapter according to um, Islamic uh, faith before the Hijira. So, uh, in a context in which the uh, Muslims are in a minority with a a religious conflict with the so-called pagans, and there are various uh, interpretations of Sab Nuzul, why are these uh, verses uh, revealed. Some people uh, say that uh, the Prophet Muhammad wanted to provide a vision to his uh, people and encouragement from God to tell the story of the past. And, and this is also to provide to his people, to his followers, a hope for the future, because the whole uh, Quranic story of Joseph is linked to an eschatological idea. So difficult times are to be overcome with faith in firm faith in God. Some, uh, let's say, minority interpreters want also to 
include an approach where these mechanics are in dialogue with some Jewish ones, but this is a weaker interpretation because when we speak of a dialogue between Muslims and Jews, well, this is something which uh, occurred in Medina. Uh, important uh, here is uh, to consider how Philo wanted to tell the story of Joseph in a Greco-Roman context. And I would say that for uh, Muslims today, not just Joseph, but all the Catholic Christian context, those who live in a minority in uh, Muslim context, particularly when, uh, with regard to interreligious uh, dialogue, it's very difficult to tell the story of Joseph and other figures in the Quran. There are lots of uh, common points. The stories are very close, but sometimes there are differences, and these differences can open up a big uh, gap between uh, interpretations of the text. Just to give you a very simple example, if a Muslim tells the story of Joseph in a Italian Catholic context, first of all, when you hear the name Joseph, for asking which Joseph this is, uh, the uh, husband of uh, Mary is the person. Uh, who is the thought of much more, uh, much better known. And so it always has to be specified who we're referring to. At the time of Philo, this figure of uh, Joseph, uh, husband of Mary, didn't exist. But today, after many centuries, there are two Josephs. And uh, we have to be very clear um, in referring to the biblical and Quranic uh, context. For the Muslims, in the first few centuries, this uh, also uh, was an issue because uh, many interpreted Interpreters of the Quran referred to the biblical Joseph to understand better the verses in the Quran. And this is a link with um, Philo's um, approach. The early uh, interpreters of the Muslim world uh, were also under the influence of Plato. And so this uh, allows us to understand the relationship between uh, the um, with the creation through Plato. And this was a widespread tradition in these early centuries of Islam. And uh, this leads us to understand these verses better. I'll now move to uh, some uh, verses to try and explain things I preferred to provide the text, since it's a text which is uh, much less well known than uh, the biblical text. And here, the Joseph, Yusuf, as a statesman, uh, I've tried to um, analyze him in various ways. Here, as, uh, as a political person, not just as a uh, governor, and here we can see a, use, a political Yusuf in the broader sense of the term. What we can say in our postmodern age as the everyday politician, so uh, relations of all kinds with the family and uh, everyday actions are part of politics. And I try to look at Yusuf from this point of view. First of all, I'm not going to read all these verses, just a few. I'd like to uh, stress also the link between two texts. Uh, fourth verse. 
tells us, uh, refers to the Bible, some um, very strong link with some, some Quranic uh, verses and biblical verses. So two things, the historical approach to the Quran, critical historical approach to the Quran, tries to find these uh, historical links uh, to see why these verses have been put into the Quran. But if you take the um, historical, di the religious dialogue um, approach, trying to understand your interlocutor on their terms, the Quranic text is considered uh, as Logos, the word of God by the Muslims, and the figure of Joseph, which according to the chapter, uh, this verse is another point of reference to um, understand the acceptance of previous revelations by the Quran, which we'll be seeing uh, later, which is also uh, spoken of by the professor Tawil al-Jil, so we have a verse which is basically um, fully taken from the Bible. So we have Yusuf, we start with a interpreter of dreams, which is very important because uh, initially during the uh, story when he was in jail and then when he was in the presence of the Pharaoh, the king, and also at the end, because at the end we see that Yusuf uh, meets his father Jacob and says, do you remember what I told you? And uh, so in the end together they see how this uh, dream uh, took place in their lives. Uh, Joseph Yusuf is an immigrant, that's very political. Um, uh, issue today. He arrived um, um, highlighted this um, relationship between uh, Yusuf and Putifar in the Bible. Uh, it was said that this is a powerful person not a specific, with a specific name. But here we say Yusuf as an immigrant in uh, Egypt and today this is an image which uh, some Muslims refer to uh, to explain what it's like to be an immigrant, a stranger in a foreign land. The, uh, Yusuf um, is very respectful of the law. He committed no uh, offense, but here in the, he, he respects the law, but uh, in the law, there's a uh, legal lesson here. So, his, uh, sorry, 27. And if his garment is torn from the back, then she lied, and he is telling the truth. So, um, Potiphar and Sis and Yusuf are together. A witness tries to explain things and say, we need to understand uh, which side the uh, chair was made from. Because here we're speaking of the facts. There's a reference to the facts. We should not solely uh, stick with the story and what was uh, said by somebody, but we also need to uh, observe things too. So uh, Yusuf here goes to prison, uh, though innocent, and we see that uh, Yusuf is very patient and respectful of the law. Then uh, Yusuf, another important uh, fact, um, I'm again talking of the political Yusuf, uh, the uh, companions in prison. This is not only a teacher, he tries to eliminate uh, and tries to interpret the dreams. And we shall see in the verses that Yusuf is trying to form 
his own prison companions to try and give them a different vision of the world. So I would say that this is very interesting because here we look at the exegesis of the Quran, which is a very recent, dating back to the 20th century, of a scholar, an occult scholar from Turkey that died in 1960, Sainursi, and which had to be kept in prison for more than 30 years because of his own ideas. And Sainursi, for example, did talk about uh, the prison with these words, the madrasa of Yusuf. So Yusuf is a model and comes with a model of prison where there was Yusuf. It wasn't just uh, any kind of a prison. It was a place of study, a place of teaching. And here, I would say that here there is another approach which comes along with the figure of Yusuf. And there is a big problem here that affects the entire Muslim world, that is how to deal with the prisoners. Should we leave them there to their own destiny and abandon them, which is what we sometimes see in extreme cases. Sometimes extremism is very much present in prisons. So this could be another model that has been offered by the Quranic uh, Yusuf figure. Then here, this is even better known in the Yoram, that is uh, Yusuf the governor. And here maybe this is explained by Philo. Here we see the relation with the governor of Egypt, uh, with its people, which is then going to become its own people, because here he is giving an example, the example of the good governor. And here we see that whenever we talk about this figure in the Quran, the, the good governor, and as we see in verse 57, there is a recall to the hereafter, that is, to the world that is to come. And this world, even if well governed by a righteous, righteous governor such as Yusuf, nonetheless, there still is a reference to the hereafter in the Quranic language, whereby this world is a, a temporary world because references are made to the hereafter as the final home, the final place for the human being. And then another very impor important uh, political theme is the Yusuf that uh, reverses uh, the uh, roles. Uh, I wouldn't want to go into the details. We know that the Quran narrates uh, the relationship with his brothers and uh, how they then wanted to kill him. And then here we see the figure of Yusuf, that is uh, the Quranic Joseph, uh, welcoming his brothers. And there are a number of steps. Uh, the steps uh, are the ones where the teachings are imparted, necessary teachings are imparted to the brothers. But then in the end, the moment comes for reconciliation with his siblings. And here again, the very difficult moment, uh, especially during ethnic and cultural conflicts, is the one of reconciliation. Because uh, we are not to forget everything of what happened, but rather we should uh, learn the lessons uh, coming from our past uh, and forget uh, the evil that belongs to the past, so as to create a bridge towards the future, the new future. And I believe that this is what belongs to the Joseph Yusuf of the Quran, which is very evident, very obvious. And then in the end, let me conclude by mentioning the approach that was left to us by Joseph in the Quranic verses, because Joseph in the Quran, as I said, has been described 
according to a vision which is very close to the one of the Bible. There are differences, quite obviously. There are different nuances, and we have to underline them. But nonetheless, the message as Nabi and Nawim and God in the biblical jargon. And here, why is this important? Well, because it's narrated. And even what I did try to interpret in a different way, while still trying to reconnect to the vision of the statement, the political Joseph. And uh, in the Quran, the Joseph of the Quran ends the narration by stressing the prophecy. That is what in that moment Muhammad was uh, revealing and sharing uh, with people, with its own people. And when considering the example of uh, Joseph, uh, Yusuf, uh, to, that was done in order to confirm the truth, the truth of being a messenger of God. And here again, this was done by establishing a link with uh, Muhammad. And here we see the spiritual Nubu'e offspring, which was uh, reconstructed in the Quran, the descendants. And what is important here to make you understand the relationship between the Quran and the Bible, especially through the figure of Yusuf? Well, with this respect, I think that it's worth the while going to the last verse, 111. In their history, there is a lesson for those who possess intelligence. This is not a fabricated uh, discourse, but rather a divine revelation. This is a confirmation of previous revelations, an explanation, a clear explanation of everything. And it is a guide and a mercy for the people who believe, for those who believe. So ending and coming to the end of the narration of Joseph, the Quran leaves this the following comment. That is, uh, everything has been narrated in the previous uh, revelation. And thanks to this verse, but at the end of the narration, uh, there is a confirmation also of the truth of the previous revelation. And the, this has been connected and linked to the truth of the Quran. So those who listen the story should learn something out of this figure. They should be inspired by the figure of Joseph. I think that uh, this is where I should stop and end on this note, and I would be very happy to answer your question. Many thanks to you, Chenna, from the Tevere Institute. I believe that this is a very interesting uh, presentation. You did uh, understand the spirit of our encounters, of our meetings, from the viewpoint of the Senap, I would like to ask you, meanwhile, whether the figure of Joseph stands as an exception from the point of view of the possibility of having an interreligious uh, uh, discussion or confrontation inside the framework of the Quran, or are there any other figures that lend themselves to any such cross-sectional figures? Yeah, well, yes, there is uh, the Virgin Mary, Jesus Christ, but most of all, Moses because uh, the mostly quoted character in the Quran is Moses. Many Muslims are not w much aware of this. And uh, now this is a recited Quran text, and according to the Islam text uh, and faith, this was revealed in the time span of 23 years. From the Muslim point of view, if we take a look at what was the choice of God, then we could say that uh, this uh, figure, the figure of Moses, is the one that's mostly quoted. Very interesting, just like many others, such as uh, Jacob, Abraham, another very important figure, especially in these days after the apostolic uh, trip of Pope Francis. And uh, Abraham is also very much central, together with many other figures. But uh, there, may, there are also other concepts which prove to be central. There are obviously differences. And I think that now Livia wanted to say something. Well, yes, there, ha there are a number of uh, questions. One is uh, from Miriam Silvera. She will take the floor tomorrow as a speaker. And she was making a comment uh, rather than a question. And she said uh, something about the importance of the vest uh, and the fact that uh, Muhammad uh, 
uses this narration to infuse hope in his people. Can you answer this? Would you like to elaborate on that? Yes. Now, this is a, a verse which represents a very difficult moment. Uh, there was an embargo against uh, the Muslims. There was uh, a great difficulty in terms of survival. They could not express themselves as Muslims, and they had this. Uh, they were met by this great difficulty, and that had to do with the right to have uh, their own, and to uh, follow their own religion. So maybe this is the message. If we may, I would like to do something more basic, but if we look at these terms, uh, we should look at the cultural framework, the human framework, uh, the one belonging to the Prophet Muhammad. The, and here we see the Archangel Gabriel coming, and he shares uh, with his uh, people all this. Uh, the verses. Uh, coexist with this period and in order to approach the public i'm using this term because we could also uh, interpret many other aspects uh, we have uh, many experts here with us today but uh, my approach is uh, aiming at making you understand uh, how things work according to the muslim mindset um, there is uh, I think that here we are confronted with a specific moment, because before Aijira, the message, or rather the example, was not only leading to the hope of uh, being the winners at the end of the crisis, but on the other side, this was also leaving some doubts in the minds of people and in case of difficulties uh, people had doubts about the prophecy is he truly the prophet there are so many moments uh, of crisis in the span of 22 23 years so this is an example that was leading to great hope i would say thank you Senna. our colleague silvera specified that uh, the idea was the one of uh, proceeding with the investigation as to the robe uh, that was uh, ripped from behind uh, and here this is something that leads to a change from a legal point of view from a juridical point of view many years ago Massimo you and many other friends know the lay center in 2008 I was organizing something centering centered on Joseph that's when we started discussing about this theme this is a very tiny detail but nonetheless a very important one indeed and uh, here we see also apart from the testimony there is a diversification a difference between the Bible and the Quran the Quran is explaining the example of Yusuf, who is a very chaste and firmly chaste person, but also his own proof. And why is this important? Well, because he is a slave, an, uh, a eunuch. He did not have the same authority of saying whatever could be said. So we are talking about social classes and the wife of Potiphar is going to be believed by the judges because of her being of a given class in this case, so as to protect the weakest, the marginalized ones. Uh, it is important to recall the objective facts, not just uh, the witnesses. So I think that this is something we should uh, discuss further to a further level, not only to the purpose of protecting the ones who are weak, but also to give you a framework, a, a juridical framework, according to which we could review <coughs> the meaning of facts. Many thanks, Chenap because uh, I would like to say that some of the topics uh, and materials you've dealt with are exactly the ones we did consider 
and that had been chosen for May the last that were suggested by Mario Guaraldi especially because he is the one who suggested to use uh, the figure of Joseph uh, uh, as the foreigner, the prisoner. And uh, unfortunately, we know what happened uh, last March. Uh, we had to abruptly change all of our plans. But thank you, because today you could uh, once again, refocus on our own idea and uh, grasp it. Thank you for doing that.